establishment. Part of that effort was looking at uh, water supply, water availability. Uh, this community expressed uh, concerns regarding the availability of water here and its ability to meet uh, the growth that was occurring. In part, as a result of your interest in that issue and the broader issue uh, across the county, we started implementing groundwater monitoring. And I think we started in this area about 2007. And since it, we've been conducting uh, water level measurements twice a year in the wells, people have been kind enough to volunteer to let us uh, monitor. Uh, this past, and over that period of time, and our uh, team will get into it, we've noticed additional uh, groundwater declines. And tonight, uh, we're going to get together here and talk about uh, what we're finding. Uh, what are some of the issues, particularly within a, a, a sub area of High Prairie that's having that's having issues, and get a conversation on the path forward? Uh, I think maybe to really start off, if we could do some introductions so that we sort of know who's here. Uh, again, my name is David Poore. I'm with Click Attack County. Uh, we have Steve Germiat and Dave Rue with Aspect Consulting. They're hydrogeologists. They've been helping us with the groundwater monitoring study. Commissioner Sauter, we'll have you next. No, go ahead. You're Commissioner Sauter, and then one star here. Just a name, are you a high priority resident? Or you just a Jeffrey Mama? Yes. <coughs> name? Say your name. Name? Huh? Your name. Name. <laughs> but, yes. But, Gail and Larry Dennis, high priority resident. Nice to meet you. Warden of Alberta Copper, high priority. Henry Highway, Marlon Allison, Tom Powell, and Chris Adams, Chris Centerville. Uh, Kelly Dale Kaufman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rick Kaufman. I'll go with Bill Kearns. Alan Kearns. Mm -hmm. uh, Doug Taylor, 876 Centerville Highway. David Sobrisville, um, Mount Adams View Road. John Cox, John and Linda Cox, we're right up here, Edmonds View Road. What's that at all? I've heard. Tori Weaver, wannabe, I've heard. <laughs> Larry and Susan Long, we're kind of low prairie down there by Rolling Road. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, Travis Wallace, Shilling Road. Jess Davenport, Conservation District in Gold Hill. Kate Markowski, Conservation District in Gold Hill. John Kirk, Goldendale. I'm John Graham. I live about half a mile up that hill right there. John Sutko, about a mile as the crow flies to the left. Mike Eggleston, I live right over here on Centerville. Mm -hmm. Mark Harvey of Bill Prairie. Mm -hmm. Kirsten Chillin, Wicketech County. Mm -hmm. Did you get it? Uh, Ed Dottie, mm -hmm. I live up on the east end of High Prairie Road. Ted McCurcher, I throw rocks with John Graham. Oh, okay. <laughs> Heidi Musgrave, Stack of Butte. Heidi Musgrave. Well, thank you all for coming. I think we might as well just jump right into it. I'll hand the mic to Steve Jermiak and he'll start going over uh, sort of a summary of an effort the commissioners commissioned this spring to, to take a focused look at you know, the problem areas and where we're seeing folks having to deepen their wells. Thank you all for coming. Yeah, my name is Steve Jermiat. I'm an aspect consultant and I've been working um, with the county and the watershed group really since about 2002. I'm at 30. Um, so maybe just by way of background, for those of you who may have been here three years ago, I was here presenting the results of the initial study we did was a water availability study. Um, and for those of you who don't have a copy of that, it is available on the county's website and provide that information if you haven't seen it, it's available. Um, the, and that water availability study was, was one of probably six or seven that we've done throughout the watershed. So we did one specifically for High Prairie, we've done one for the Little Clickitat Basin, Swale Creek Basin, Dallas Port, so a number of them. Uh, really the intent of that study was to kind of compile the hydrologic information with a view towards water availability. And water availability certainly is one of the main criteria that the Department 
ecology looks at with respect to appropriating new water rights. So what we were trying to do was sort of assemble for ecology's benefit a lot of the subsurface information, put it all together into sort of a conceptual model, our understanding of the hydrogeology, look at the water use as we could estimate it, in the basin, look at the amount of groundwater recharge, and all of those factors that factor into a water balance for this smaller basin. Um, that basin is what we call, or the study was a basin scale assessment, so it wasn't super detailed on a well or a specific area. It was for a specific um, several square miles. So it was sort of a course assessment, but it was a good um, basin scale assessment that was sort of the starting point with respect to looking at water availability. And as Dave mentioned, we started water level monitoring in many of your wells started back in 2007. And even in the 2011 study, there were three wells that we identified in that study where we were beginning to see some declines. Okay, we had some kind of stable water levels, and then um, in the last couple of years of the monitoring program, we began to see some declines. And that was identified, and when I was here three years ago, we started to talk about that and talk about the potential causes for that. And I think a lot of the causes, as we'll talk about here, Again, today are sort of the natural hydrogeologic system itself. There are some challenges with respect to water supply up here in High Prairie, and we'll talk about that. Um, an additional study in 2013 was just to, every two years we've been sort of updating the water level monitoring, and this is for the entire water, but certainly High Prairie is a piece of that. So in that 2013 study, obviously we had two more years of data collected, and uh, we continue to see the, the declines in those three wells. And I guess I would say, at that same time, we were beginning to hear from our coming up here and monitoring your wells more and more concern over this issue of declining water levels. Um, so then this, this fall, the county uh, commissioned an additional study to look specifically at this area that we're, it's kind of between Dillacourt and Knight Canyons. And that's the area that, um, based on information from the community, where we're seeing several wells, not beyond just three. It sounds like there's quite a few wells where we're beginning to see the declines, or the declines are getting more severe. So that's what we're here to talk about today, is sort of focus in on this specific area of, um, between uh, Knight and Dillacourt Canyons. So, what I have displayed here now is a regional cross-section. So we're looking at what's beneath the surface, sort of in a cross-sectional view. We just chop down through, and you're seeing it in vertical. So we've got the ground surface uh, up here, and we've got High Prairie here in the center. I think what's important here is to understand that High Prairie is um, it's, it's like an isthmus, if you will. It's surrounded, as you know, since you live here by Swale Creek on the east and the main stem of the Catan River in the west. And we have beneath the surface where, where all the water supply aquifers are, and you know, like Dave talked a little more about those. But one of the one of the challenges, if you will, is that High Prairie is fairly isolated. Okay, it's it's topographically incised by Swale Creek and by the Catan River and on the north side. And so, you know, some of the shallower um, uh, streams as well. The reason this becomes a challenge is that when you start to pump wells, there needs to be somewhere for that groundwater to come from to replenish. And if you've got the area sort of incised and cut off by the topography, that's much more challenging. You don't necessarily have the groundwater. The groundwater can't necessarily come laterally and replenish the wells. So now, your sole source supply, source of supply is coming vertically through recharge, and that makes a challenge. And we'll get more into this as well, but you also have a series of geologic structures, folds and faults. So a fold is you just take basalt layers and you literally fold them, which and we'll talk a little bit about that. That can be um, actually a barrier to groundwater flow, these geologic structures, and that's an additional challenge on top of just being sort of topographically incised, you also have a series of geologic structures. 
So that just sort of starts to set, give you the setting for the hydrogeology that I think is largely um, a factor in why we're getting some declines in here. So that's what we kind of want to talk about here, is just to, I guess, educate people, make them aware of the subsurface conditions for this specific area, and then we can talk about sort of some of the management techniques and some of the options, perhaps, on how to address this. So with that, I'm going to bring Dave up, and Dave's been working on here since 2007. A lot of you may know Dave from water level monitoring interactions on, on that. So. Thank you. I'd like to encourage everyone to ask me questions as they come up. I'm going to walk everybody through this, but um, if we all wait till the end, I think we might forget something. We might forget all of them. So just please raise your hand if you have a question, and I'll do my best to try and address it. So here's a zoomed in view that we made of our nine helicor study area. All these colors that you're seeing are that's the surface geology. That's a publicly available data set. It's from the State Department of Natural Resources. Um, as Steve mentioned earlier, there are a few geologic structures in this area that we want to point out. Um, one being a large fault here along uh, just south of Centerville Highway. Uh, there's also another large fault over here to the west on the other side of Night Canyon. And just out of frame, there's also another fault over here. So that sets the picture for the larger area. But when we zoom in even closer than that, you see these canyons here, Delacour Canyon and Knight Canyon. As we follow the stream bed, you see these different colors start to pop up. These different colors are different basalt units, different aquifers, if you will. And that makes it, um, as Steve mentioned, if you pump water out of your well, it needs to come back in from somewhere else. And these canyons here effectively um, cut off portions of the side prairie area. Dave, could you put a pointer about where we are right now? Yeah, Someone will correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure. <laughs> right about there? In the close? Could you go back, please? And sure. You know Centerville Highway yep. and then roads that run north. Yes. Silly Road, Harlem, High Prairie, etc. Can you denote that? Yep, those are on here, but it's hard to see on the uh, projector. So Centerville Highway is right about here. Um, I believe Heartland Road may be off the frame. Um, I think night. Night road, or is this what road is this? Well, so the wrong struck. Oh, struck, okay, that's struck. So maybe night road takes off from struck. He's yeah. down there. You'll have to forgive, I know the geology a lot better than the roads. <laughs> <laughs>
basically for the entire thickness of the salt flow, uh, this could be 50 to several hundred feet thick. Um, if you get a drill right now and go outside, you will generally only find groundwater in the top and in the very bottom of the flow. Can you give us a perspective on what the distance of that slide is right there? This isn't, this isn't uh, actually a problem. This is just sort of a cartoon. Okay. Uh, but this could be, on the scale of 50 feet, this could be up to three, 400 feet, I think. Right. Um, in this area, in a few slides, I'll put up a cross section. Um, some of the shallower basalt units are on the order of 50 feet. And um, I know the, the deepest basalt unit that's generally mapped is about grand rocks, extremely thick. Yeah, but any of those formations can have multiple flows in them. So you have, you have probably tens of these types of zones in the hundreds and thousands of feet that you need like to have your wells in. So you've got your permeable flow top from each flow, and that's where gas bubbles form as this uh, liquid magma is cooling. And on the bottom, you get some fracturing from this liquid moving along an already solid ground surface. So where these flow tops and flow bottoms meet each other is where you, where you find all your groundwater. Um, so in addition to these horizontal barriers to groundwater flow that I discussed just on the last slide, these faults and the canyons, you've got these vertical barriers, which are these flow interiors. So there's essentially small pockets of groundwater all over this area that may or may not be connected to each other. So are you saying most of this area is just strictly groundwater? Yes. There yes. is no underground rivers? Just... No, it's just uh, saturated basalt. You guys have any other questions? So this is a, a cross section that uh, we originally made in 2011 in our high prairie water availability study that is available on the DNR, on the county DNR website. Um, we, um, we added a few wells that have been deepened recently, and we also added um, some water levels that have, that have declined, just to put everything into a, uh, into a scale. So I guess what we want to look at in this slide is that most of, most of the wells that we've reviewed in the area are completed in um, these shallower basalt units, um, you know, between what are most of your wells, 100 to 300 feet. I know there are some, some of you that have wells that are maybe six or 700 feet deep or even deeper, but looking at the whole area, most of them are generally 300 feet or less. So another thing you'll notice on here is um, Maybe it's hard to see on the, on the screen, but if you look on your slides, um, we put these dashed blue lines where the well drillers have indicated that groundwater is present. So if you think back to my last slide about the basalt hydrogeology, all the water that we see that comes into your wells is from, uh, from where these flows meet each other. These are different. These are different colors. These are different basalt flows. But the water is um, is vertically vertically isolated, as well as horizontally isolated from large structures that you see here. This is the uh, a thrust fault that is next to the center of the body. So, if we look at well density, as many of you know. There's been a significant amount of growth in this area over the past decade or two. Um, it's not a surprise that um, some of the areas of groundwater decline that we've observed line up pretty well with areas of higher well density. So these are color coded. Um, each one of these little squares is quarter quarter section. And the main area of water level decline that we've seen it's really been growing recently is, is in this area here that's right near and just north of Centerville Highway. Um, 
where you can see there's some areas where there are um, five wells in a single quarter quarter section. Um, there are some other areas further up on High Prairie and, and uh, just on the other side of Knight Canyon that have similar well densities, but to date we haven't observed groundwater declines in those areas specifically. Um, so since we started our monitoring network here, we've got nine wells that we've been measuring since 2007 that are between Knight and Dillacourt Canyons. Uh, those wells are marked with red dots here, they're kind of hard to see. But out of those uh, out of those nine wells, um, I think six of them have had stable water levels. Um, also, we've included on this map um, empirical data that we received from the community. These uh, parcels here that are shaded in light blue indicate declining water levels. Either we've measured those declines or someone's wells went dry. I think you can all agree with me. If your well goes dry, that's a pretty good indicator that you've got a declining water level. Uh, also, we drew in, um, as many of you are aware, there's an area here up by Centerville Highway where uh, a large number of residents have had to get their wells deepened just in the past few years. We've outlined those parcels in red. So if, we, if you can hold this picture in your head for a second, and we go back to the well density, you can see that this is the same, this is the same area. The water level declines do line up pretty well with uh, higher well density. This is an example of one of the wells that we've been monitoring um, since 2007. Uh, it was stable for the first few measurements. We measured these wells twice a year, <clears throat> once in the spring before irrigation starts, even though know, there's not really irrigation around here. And then we measured them a second time in the fall. Um, so since we've started measuring this well, we've observed over 50 feet of decline. 23 feet of decline in the first three years, and in the last two years, um, 30 feet of decline. So, this is probably the worst case that we've seen in the area. What, in your opinion, is the, is the worst month for? I mean, there's a recovery time and everything for the water to be replenished. What do you think is the worst for the, the driest? Month. Well, we did a water balance in uh, our 2011 High Prairie report, and I think there's um, little infiltration that occurs during the winter, so I'm not sure. Yeah, I think before the declines, if you look at the first several data points, you don't see great fluctuations seasonally between summer and winter, but typically, regionally, you'll see your higher levels. Um, spring and summer actually and then they take everything is behind the precipitation always there's, there's a certain lag time between what the precipitation is falling and when you actually might see it in a water well and obviously that the time difference depends on how deep the well is so there's a lot of factors in it but in general you should see higher levels spring and summer and then lower uh, into the fall and winter in this area you know obviously that's much more um, pronounced in areas that are doing a lot of irrigation going to a place tonight, uh, further east of the horse heaven, where you see the dramatic differences because of irrigation, and probably down in Swale Valley, you see that also. Here, because there's as much uh, irrigation or negligible, it's probably not nearly as dramatic, but I think in general, the pattern I just described is probably fairly accurate. So uh, now it might be near the, the decline because the recharge hasn't necessarily hit yet in their spine. Uh, so you sort of assume equivalent usage for many of these wells? Equivalent usage do you mean throughout the year? Yeah, the amount of water consumed or extracted. Yeah, and we actually we don't we don't typically keep track of that. We've just been uh, we've just been measuring uh, measuring the level in the well um, in the spring and in the fall. Um, we're not we're not aware of yeah, you should have the most, it's a good point, you should have the most use in the summer. I assume most people would probably say that they use more water in the summer. Yeah. Um, we're not aware there's a lot of outdoor use here. I'm assuming most of it is, is indoor, but even with that, I think there's probably a greater water use in the summer than in the, 
in the winter. So that, that, that is also a factor that's sort of superimposed on what the natural system is doing. You know, I correctly agree that basically the groundwater is recharged due to rainfall as opposed to snow melt. Is that correct? To the extent there's snow melt coming off the Columbia Hills, then that would be recharged as well. That's a good point. So most of that probably happens in springtime. Is there any truth to the rumor of the you know, wise tale of underground, take all the rivers, but <coughs> hydrological events that come out of the Columbia and say way up into this area? Or is that just a little more? It sounds like a lark. Sounds, like <laughs> sounds like the second one to me. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah, I think one of the, you know, we, we've talked a lot about the thrust fault. The Columbia Hills are a massive, very complicated set of geologic structures. It's not just one, there's a bunch of them there. And I think, you know, I've got John Kirk sitting over there, and he studied this whole area probably more than I have, but I think in general, we treat the Columbia Hills as being a pretty good groundwater barrier. So I wouldn't expect communication between the Columbia and this area. And on this cross section here, you see that this deep basalt unit here is brown. This deep this basalt unit here is brown. That's that's the same basalt unit that was offset 800 plus feet. So, so that's the Columbia Hills to the right side. Of that's correct. Yep, south and yeah. north. Yep. Why is there some springs near run near round? They just uh, they happen to intersect one of these uh, one of the interflow zones where it hits the surface. But I mean, they're higher. The springs are higher than anything around them. Well, the, not than the top of the mountain. It's just uh, recharge making its way down through the ground. Is there a possibility that? Settling ponds could be put in to help recharge water in certain areas where geology is conducive for that. They would have to be very carefully sighted in order to for that water to make it make it down deep enough. Would it be very many places? Yeah, be? no, there it would be very difficult to site that properly. And, and what would be the water you'd put in that? Just rainwater. Well, like if you had seasonal flows, and if you could make a pond under where there's a place where the water can saturate and soak in and replenish. I heard of that done other places, but like you said, it just depends well, on the geology. Yeah, the geology here might make that challenging. But you could use that water for non-domestic use to reduce your domestic demand. That might be more feasible. Yeah, I don't think there's people live here and you know more than do that. I suspect you don't see a great deal of surface runoff up here. Do you? Well, what, about, what about springs though? Do they add anything to the to the underground water? <coughs> well I, I think that's that's where groundwater is coming out of the ground already. So it was groundwater. Um, so it's just a function of where that is. No, I, I think to the extent that it comes out of the ground and re-infiltrates, well yeah then it would. But it's already it was groundwater before it discharged. So it's just maybe moving which of these aquifer zones it's moving from and then into via infiltration. Does anyone else have any questions? Yeah, I have more. Were you personally involved in the 2007 study? Yes. In the 2007 study, I have that report. If I recall, there's something like 387 wells in this geographical area. Many of them were dry at that time. How many are now increased since 2007? How many more wells have been put into this geographical area? I'm not sure of the exact numbers, but you can look on the uh, State Department of Ecology. Every time a well is drilled, um, the driller has to submit a form that has a log of what they encountered and details about the well they left in the ground. So I don't know those numbers exactly, but that's that's public information that's available. Following that report, Doug Taylor and myself met with the county commissioner. 
we felt that that report was incorrect. We challenged it as Dave understands. Now, during that report, we had developers coming into this area and they wanted a well almost put in for every two acres, every five acres. Our challenge was with the county commissioners was that he was going to talk about that for one well for 20 acres. Now, if you divide that 20 acres into short plots or five acre plots and you sell it to four different individuals, do they each get a well put into that five acre plot, or do they have to go back to that original 20 and have one well for all five or four plots? What are the political requirements today? Does it go to your department or does it go to the planning department? Well, it's not my department. not <laughs> 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 through the planning department, if uh, most of these wells are, are what we call permit exempt, so they don't have to file an application to have a water, water right for domestic use, they can go out and drill a well. If, they're, if a developer is subdividing the land, then they, they look at that as, it can, it, they still have one well and it can serve, usually it's about up to six homes, is typically the rule of thumb, I think. There's been the ability to, to put more homes on it, but they need to do covenants to prevent you know, watering the lawn and stuff. But generally about six, up to six homes can be served off of one for permitting them well. Uh, usually, you know, you don't. Uh, you know, if it's a single project, which they would consider that subdivision, then they can't they can't have a well for each one. We have a subdivision just above us, and there's a well on every Every uh, lot, you've got five acre lots, and you've got six slots there. Six different wells. How long ago? Yeah, when was that done? What was that, Jeff? That was just like 15 to 20 years ago. Yeah, see, the, the landscape has changed. Totally changed in all since then. When was that the decision on Campbell's? Question. Yeah. 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 Y
Essentially, we went from somewhere north of 30 or whatever down to two and a half to four. Boom, just yes. like that. And uh, one, uh, or one well person thought, well, maybe there's been a, some kind of a, uh, a geological shift uh, that interrupted the, uh, the aquifer or something like that. But, uh, all right. Have you experienced uh, in this area that kind of a just kind of falling off the cliff? <laughs> Some wells have, but I don't, really? there's there's it's not a geologic shift. Yeah, um, we believe yeah. this. There's nothing like that that we've seen occur. Hmm. I guess that's what I was trying to say. Is that we know you have this one area that you're aware of. I believe just by hearsay, you have a second area that which is roughly. I heard the chili road. Okay. I don't I got a feeling that you weren't aware that there was a second grade. Well there may be we we drew in this boundary out of um, a letter of concern that the county received. Yes. So I just wanted to wear the blue blue spot. Yeah, this is basically what we are aware of. It's what's in blue here. Yeah. So yeah, there's additional areas that you're you're correct. Yeah, we're not aware of that. It's probably not in our monitoring. And can you just tell me what road is that center ground? I can't see it on either. Uh, this is Centerville Highway, and it, this is struck. Um, yeah, these are our streets. These are where Heartland Road is. I believe Heartland Road is right here. Thank you. Yeah, that's the center ground. Yeah, that's the center ground. There's another big fall valley. Yeah, I remember the ground was five feet. Yep, yeah, there's this other. Yep. But is that about where Swell Canyon is or the West of Square? That's West of Square. But we had a little history, we have about five mile history here. We had a well drilled in 2000 and we had 324 feet. They had 135 foot of static, uh, no, 180 foot of static, sorry. So we had 45 gallons a minute well. And we haven't done anything to it in 11 years, 12 years. So this last past year, we had some issues with losing water occasionally. And uh, pump service came out. They end up pulling the, pulling the pump and found a bad check valve. And the top of the check valve was going up, catching in the next fitting and you know, knocking the supply off. So we put all the check valves in it and the new pump, just to be safe. 
and uh, measured the static level again, and it was 135 feet now. So the original well was drilled in January of 2000, 2001, actually. And we haven't touched it again for 12 years, and so in August we had this work done. So it's increased 45 feet of static in 12 years. Of course, we've got winter compared to fall, too. So I know there's some issues there, but I was actually surprised that it had gone up that much. It's it's probably been moving the whole time and you just happened to capture it at those two points. Happened to capture it at those two points. Right. But 45 feet is a lot. Yes, that's what we got. We're seasonal. So we're watering more. Just our heart. Who, who is that guy? <laughs> also, uh, I I wouldn't put a whole lot of trust in water level measurements unless maybe the, you're pretty confident in both of them. If you only have two, uh, I wouldn't, and they're 45 feet different, I, I wouldn't. Well, you're welcome to monitor it. <laughs> well, as a general statement, I think right now, what is my perception is that we've got this problem in this, this area we're talking about now, but in general across High Prairie, the water seems to be stable. From this other area, I believe there are two areas. <coughs> right, I'd like to some information on Well, in these areas where you're losing water, is there anything being done as far as new wells being put in or anything like that to kind of stabilize it or keep it from going completely away? Some, some well owners have had to deepen their wells, but um, hmm. we're not aware. So people are you can still go in here and drill as many wells as you want? <coughs> At this point, yeah. <laughs> we uh, had the privilege of being the first one up here to go dry about four years ago. Yeah, my question is, we are now down in the Frenchman Springs, South Dakota. Do you know how sustainable that is? Have you noticed it being more sustainable than the other ones? We're not aware yet. There aren't very many wells that are down in that unit at this time. Um, and also, none of those wells are in our monitoring network, again, because there are so few of them. Um, maybe you should we'll get your name before you leave. Um, yeah, well, we're not sure at this time. We don't, have, we, don't have, uh, we don't have any measurements from that unit yet. Can you address the issue of the cisterns and marine water catchment and the legalities of doing that in the state of Washington? Okay, before we move on to that, we could, uh, we, we discussed a little bit uh, that folks are down, going down into the Frenchman and it's, it's, it's a relatively newly tapped unit, but still the geologic structures that, that we're looking at, the Swale Canyon, the Click Attack, and then these fault systems, the fault systems go way deeper than you're ever going to be able to drill a well. Uh, so at some level, you're still within a, a confined area here. Uh, so over time, if, if everybody went to that unit, uh, you know, how thick it is, we don't know, but over time, you're, you're going to be mining water would be basically what's happening. You say that's about right. Yep, yeah, this is a, because of the structures, because of the topography, this is a tough area for water supply. It really is. And it's an area that, as Dave was mentioning, you kind of have geologic structures on all four sides, plus the topography as well. So it, it is a, a tough area. Yeah, it, it provides a solution, but yeah, when we get into this path forward stuff, so people need to be thinking we about. can't change that part of it. How to, how, to, how to conserve and be frugal with it to some extent. So um, besides obvious like you know conservation methods and stuff like that, I just was wondering, so if wells continue to go dry, um, my husband's family lives in an area of Canada where they have a water cistern underground. 
and a truck comes and delivers water, and then they pump it out of the cistern, and then when it gets low, a light comes on, and they call the truck, and the truck comes. So is that a viable option for this area if it continues to decline? Is that? Sounds like an expensive option. If you're talking about importing it, yeah. Um, I guess, yeah, one of the one of the bullets there under conservation is rainwater harvesting, and that is legal here in the state of Washington. You can collect it, collect it off your roofs or whatever. And I know there are people that are doing that. Uh, obviously, water quality is an issue. What are you using that water for? But it is legal to do it. Ecology has the right um, if. They feel there's too much of that going on. They could come in and regulate that if they feel there's impacts to stream flows or whatever. But it's almost like having an exempt well. They treat it sort of the same way. You can do it unless the, until the, or unless there's a problem. And if there's a problem in the state of Washington, who regulates water use and who owns all the water, um, can come in and deal with it then. But that is an option. And we mentioned cisterns. That's just a way to store it, but a way to collect it in the first place. Is legal to do it in Washington, and that the um, Department of Ecology. There's a fact sheet I've got a copy of that kind of clarifies that. There was an interpretive policy five years ago where they made it very explicit that that is legal enough to do. Yeah. I was going to say, uh, Chris Vassar lives across the way in an area where groundwater is limited, groundwater limited recharge, and it's used as a sister system to help to help augment your 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 water. Yeah, so that's one of the reasons I'm here is because I've, I've kind of lived through this myself. I live over uh, on the other side of the Klickitat, but it's in a similar type of situation on a little smaller scale. We haven't had any groundwater studies done, although I guess we're in an area now that's doing it, but you can put some monitors online to be fine. But we did, we had the same kind of situation where we had declines uh, and uh, we're on a couple of small systems, just a group of us that are there. And so we we saw these declines and, and when we were first there, of course everybody had yards, we walked, you know, there was plenty of water. But then we got to a point where we were seen we didn't have enough water. And so we took kind of voluntary or it was involuntary because you have to do what you have to do, where we all determined that we weren't going to use any we were only going to use the water for uh, domestic purposes, and we've been good as far as we've stabilized. As far as we've got, a, we've got plenty of water for, for domestic purposes. But then you also want to, you know, you want to have water for gardens or yard or whatever. And so I was kind of the guinea pig. I was a building contractor in my in my other life, besides being a county commissioner. And so I, you know, I had done some kind of back of the napkin calculations as far as what came off of our roof, and it just seemed like, gosh, why couldn't if I could save that from winter to summer, I could use that water for, and so I did, I built the first cistern, and it uh, was kind of a test, and that was right about when the rules changed with the college, well, they didn't really change, I would say that they were interpreted about, about four or five years ago as policy, if that was okay, if you could actually harvest your rainwater, and, and you can, as long as there's not some impairment later where if everybody's doing it and the streams dry up, then we, they'd have to look at that. <laughs> and so now what I have is, um, and all of my neighbors have done this as well, is that we collect the water off, the, off our roof gutters in the winter and we store it and that is basically our water we use in the summer for all of our landscaping. I actually have a swimming pool and that's where the water comes that, that goes for that. I mean we're very tight with water. It's, it's kind of capital intensive as far as you can be into significant amounts of dollars to build that kind of storage. And the thing about it, too, is that, I mean, the storage has to basically be perfect as far as, because any sort of leak, I mean, if you're trying to save seasonally from one season to another, as any of us know, even a dripping faucet over months of period, you, you're not going to have any water come summertime when you actually need it. But uh, we've been doing it now, I think, four, four years, five years, and it's, and it's worked. And so, as I said, I'm very sensitive to this because... I've, I've been in the same situation. How, how big is your system? Uh, my first one was, let me see, 14,000 uh, gallons. And I actually have two now as far as they're actually the, um, uh, it was actually the foundation for my shop. And so there actually are concrete vaults over them too. So there was, 
there was some significant engineering that went into it. So to do it, but there's all kinds of uh, they they do have. Yeah, obviously it's not drinking water. Although I guess in a worst case scenario, there are parts of the country where they do use it for drinking water. It has to be treated as far as to drinking water standards. But it is it's possible. It's just it's. It's not nearly as economical as you know the model that we're used to, where you drill a hole and you pull water out of it. It's good, and uh, so. But this is, I mean, obviously this is a this is a very serious issue to the county. That's why we have we put resources into it, and then we responded when we heard of kind of a more narrow spot where we, there was a problem. And you know, I've been preaching about groundwater for the last eight years, as far as that. You know, this is a big issue, and we, we need to get that information. And that's why we've always, you know, asked for people to be in the monitoring network so we can get that data. But, um, and, you know, information is important, and because we need that information so we can make decisions. And, and I want to start a discussion today, but, you know, anytime, I mean, somebody said, you know, isn't it stupid? Why would you keep drilling wells if, if there's only so much water that's going away, but you really shouldn't. But that would be kind of a land use, a zoning kind of discussion we have to have. And that's going to be a really difficult conversation to have in a community because it's, there's going to be winners and losers, basically. But it's kind of like you have to weigh the, you know, if the folks that have already here and made the investment, is it, is it really fair to let other folks come in after and now we, we've caused trouble to everybody? That would be a, you know, that would be a conversation we have to have. Well, if you have a pasture that only pastures three or four cows, you don't bring in another twenty cows to run the same pasture. Exactly. <laughs> so, this is a, this is a, you know, what's that? You know, uh, whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting, and that's what this will be when you start talking about water, because as we all know, you can't do anything without water. So you can't have development, you can't have, you can't build a house, you can't do anything. And so if there's no water, that's an issue. So well, what does our snowfall have to do with our water taking? In other words, our snowfall has dropped off 